everyone knows that TF2 is an old game, and everyone knows that TF2 has bad default settings that stunt new players' growth. But I think it's really easy for those who have played the game for so long and tailored it exactly to their preferences to forget just how bad TF2's default settings truly are. So I did what any normal person would do and reinstalled TF2 fresh to see what it's like to experience the game new and... Yeah. The topic of TF2's default settings is not a new one, and there are already some great videos on the topic you can check out here or in the description. But what I'm aiming to do is to approach it as a competitive player and do a thorough job covering exactly what changes players should make to their game to play optimally, whether that be for competitive environment or just to improve quickly without being held back by your game. A quick disclaimer also. This is not intended to be a resource on how to install or troubleshoot certain options, but rather what should be installed or changed. Of course, if it's simply a console command, I'll include the command, but for anything more complicated, I'll simply link a video going through the process, so look out for that. Now with that all out of the way, let's get down to business. It's hard to decide what the very first change that needs to be made is. I think a good place to start is the absolute basic, such as resolution. Some players do prefer different aspect ratios, and certain ratios actually have marginal effects on your vertical or horizontal FOV, but just going with your monitor's native resolution is never a bad idea. As long as you aren't running the game for some 2007 potato resolution when you have a normal monitor, you should be fine. Now it's time to get into some important early setup, first by making sure the developer console is enabled alongside fast weapon switch. Under options, then advanced, not to be confused with advanced options, you can check both of them. Fast weapon switch means that when you press a button to switch weapons, you actually switch your weapon instead of getting a weird menu pop-up that will waste valuable time in combat. The developer console is incredibly important and serves as one of the main interfaces for changing the game. For many options and settings that may be hidden through a maze of old setting browsers, there will be simple commands you can just type in the console for the same effect. Following this is something a bit more complex than just a simple setting, but I placed it this early for good reason, and it's an auto-exec file. Basically, an auto-exec is a config file that will automatically run every time you launch the game. So if you put the same commands that you would type into console in your auto-exec, then it will automatically execute all of them for you. Auto-exec is included so early here because while most settings will stick and won't undo between game sessions, it doesn't hurt to include the redundancy in an auto-exec to keep everything consistent. So settings like FOV settings, sensitivity, custom keybinds, etc. are all great commands to include in an auto-exec. The groundwork has now been laid and we can start making permanent adjustments to our game. And as many of you might guess, you need to change your FOV. FOV, or field of view, is just how much of the world you can see, and a higher FOV means you can see more. The maximum FOV TF2 allows is 90, just set it to that. Seeing more is better, and 90 is perfectly comfortable, just change it if you haven't already. Next, I want to talk about motion blur. And by talk about, I mean disable immediately, because it looks bad and makes seeing what's going on much more difficult during fights, especially when you're moving. This can be disabled in your game's video settings. So after playing with these settings for a few minutes, the game looked much better, but I felt as though something was off, as if I had really high ping. And that's when I remembered the culprit, Interp. Interp and its associated settings affect how your game interfaces with the network, and they'll influence your performance when connected to a server. Things may be tweaked here to get optimal performance depending on how strong or weak your internet connection is, but the default settings are bad, so I'm including some basic starter recommendations here. This is only a starter, and you can get very in-depth with Interp and Lerp, even having custom Lerp per class for more comfortable projectile or hit scan performance by using class configs, which I'll cover later. Basically, I'm very much oversimplifying, and this video from R does a much better job of explaining how Interp and Lerp work if you're still confused. Next, you definitely want damage numbers, hit sounds, and potentially kill sounds. Damage numbers let you see how much damage your shots do to opponents, which is crucial information for how weak a player might be, how aggressively or safely you want to play a fight, or just having the info to tell your teammates. Also, damage number batching will automatically add consecutive damage numbers together and can be adjusted for very short batches or long ones, depending on preference. 
Hit sounds are equally important for not only giving immediate feedback for when you're dealing damage, but also letting you know if you hit a player without seeing them, which can be really useful info for soldier and demo shooting around a corner to check for a player. Additionally, you can enable a kill sound, which plays a different sound when the damage you dealt killed a player. A kill sound is definitely less mandatory than a hit sound in damage numbers, but it still can provide some useful auditory information if you want to use it. Finally, both hit sounds and kill sounds can be completely customized if you're like myself and don't really like the default choices. Moving on now to the match HUD. This is one setting that Valve actually got right because it is enabled by default. The information provided on not only your own team's overall health, but also the number of dead players on both teams is immensely helpful for knowing when to push or when you need to back up and play things safe. Also, you can use it to tell if a spy is on dead ringer because quality of life changes screw over the spy. In any case, while this is enabled by default, if the match HUD was disabled for some reason, make sure to re-enable it. To finish off this section, let's wrap up with auto reload. Enabled under advanced options, this setting does exactly what it sounds like. Reloads for you once you finish shooting. Unlike some other shooters, in TF2 the reload animation can be cancelled at any time, meaning that there isn't really any downside to reloading automatically outside of maybe some view model visual clutter, but we'll cover view models later. Auto reload generally just makes your life easier without having to worry about reloading, and for that reason it's absolutely something you should use. We've finally covered most of the must-have settings. Now let's talk about some less necessary, but still beneficial changes. I've probably gone too long at this point without mentioning Master Config, a config designed by Mastercoms, who's been deconstructing TF2 and figuring out how to optimize it for years. Master Config has most of what I've talked about already built in, as well as different preset options intended to squeeze out as much performance as possible from all ranges of different hardware. Frame rate is quite important, and getting a consistent frame rate at or above your monitor's refresh rate will make the game way better to play. So, whether you want the settings I've covered taken care of automatically, or your frame rate is consistently low and you want better performance, then there are different master config presets that suit those goals. One more thing I want to bring attention to concerning this topic is shadows. Most configs either lower or disable shadows entirely in order to get better frame rate performance. However, because of patented source engine jank, shadows can sometimes bleed through walls in limited spots on limited maps. Many people who have played Metalworks are already familiar with shadows showing through the wall between house and second, but with maxed out shadows, there's a few more spots where you can gain information from shadows. The most relevant is being able to predict when an uber is about to get popped through top left when holding sunshine last, or sometimes being able to identify a soldier holding on top of cafe when trying to push into mid. Shadows aren't game-changing in any stretch of the imagination, but getting more information for effectively free in certain holds might be worth the marginal frame rate hit, so I figured I'd mention it. Moving on now to a resupply bind, or banny bind as competitive players sometimes call it. If you enable the advanced option to resupply on loadout change, then you can bind a key to update to a loadout. This can be done to easily switch between different loadouts, but more importantly, it can be used to change to the loadout you're already on to force a resupply. What this means is that if you're within the spawn room, you'll automatically be placed into a spawn position, like at the start of a round, with full HP and ammo. Not only is this usually faster than walking to a resupply locker, but you also restore your crit heals, and in some cases, it can straight up teleport you out of danger. This bind can be inconsistent in timing, depending on the item servers, but also provides a ton of quality of life between swapping loadouts easily, cycling through spawns on maps that have multiple spawn rooms, and the massive value it provides in a competitive setting. A resupply bind is definitely worth considering. On the topic of key binds, Medic has some useful ones, but first we have to talk about class configs. While an auto exec config executes commands on launch, you can set up class-specific configs that execute when you switch to that class. Class configs can be used for a variety of cases, from class-specific keybinds to even hit scan versus projectile interp optimization that I mentioned earlier. To keep things basic though, Medic benefits a lot from custom keybinds, and an Uber chat bind is the first example. An Uber chat bind will send some custom message in team chat whenever you use an Uber. 
This is useful information for knowing when to push, especially in a setting with little to no communication. Next, Uber masking and faking calls. These both serve the same purpose, to confuse or bluff the state of your own Uber charge for your opponents. An Uber mask is when you use a voice command to override the usual voice line Medic says when he gets an Uber. You can do this by simply calling for Medic, but most players prefer to use a particularly hard to hear voice command instead. Either way, the point is to conceal the fact that you have Uber for the enemy team, denying them information and maybe goading them into a bad push. On the flip side, you have access to the fully charged voice line, so you can bind one key press to fake having Uber charge. This is very helpful when the Uber margins are quite narrow and you're scared that an opponent might use their slim Uber advantage. In cases like those, an enemy hearing a fake call might think that Ubers have evened out and cancel the push altogether. Also, while on the topic of medic in particular, the teammates auto call when hurt and medigun continuously heal options in advanced options are quite helpful to include as well. But in any case, class configs can be nice when you want to have keybinds or settings locked to certain classes. Finally, let's talk about demos, and for once, no, I'm not talking about Demo Man. TF2 has a built-in demo system wherein you can record and watch back demo files. This can be useful if you want an easy way to save your gameplay for watching back later. And if you play in a competitive league, then demos will likely be mandatory to record and may be requested or reviewed in anti-cheat cases. Demo files can also be shared and then watched by anyone with TF2, letting players review their gameplay with others in order to improve. TF2 itself has a built-in demo recording system, and you can record a demo at a moment's notice with the record command. But for competitive players, I highly recommend installing PREC, which not only automates the recording, but also makes organization a lot easier. Now that we've wrapped up what's useful to have but not necessary, it's time to move on to settings that are almost entirely preference, starting with view models. View model settings come with some trade-off. The default view model is obviously just bad, it's absolutely massive and just obstructs your vision for no reason. But disabling view models entirely might make it hard to remember which weapon you have out. Some players disable view models but only on certain weapons, others toggle them on and off, some install custom transparent view models, yet most just pick a setting and leave it. It's worth mentioning while we're here that if you're a medic that prefers playing without view models, then you can also use view model offset commands to get your medi beam out of the way as well. So feel free to experiment and see what view model settings you like to play with. In this regard, custom HUDs are quite similar. Custom HUDs can change just about everything about how your game looks. From menus, to damage numbers, to kill feed, there's very little a HUD can't change. With that being said though, TF2 is a game where information matters a lot, and any HUD you use absolutely needs the basics like health and ammo, but also more specific info like sticky bomb charge, uber percentage, soldier banner percent, and more. As long as a custom HUD conveys all the important information, which most of them certainly will, then it's really a matter of what layout and look is best for you. As far as finding a custom HUD goes, huds.tf, or rather their Discord server, is a good resource for any HUD-related questions, and Mastercoms has a nice HUD repository to browse for one that you like. Another optimization you can make is tackling visual clutter. Of course, not every competitive player's game looks like Minecraft, but even players without FPS configs, or whose games have pretty high settings, will still make some tweaks in order to make the game easier to read moment by moment. The most common is disabling ragdolls and sometimes gibs. While ragdolls might be charming and lead to funny moments for many casual players, in a competitive environment, some people prefer the instant feedback for when a player dies, as well as cutting back on visual clutter and ensuring bodies don't accidentally block potentially crucial info like where a sticky might be hiding. Again, ragdolls and gibs are ultimately preference, but there is a reason that players disable them besides just squeezing out a higher frame rate. Similarly, another somewhat popular choice is installing a script to remove the smoke decals from explosions. Yet again, this change aims to make the battlefield easier to see without as much clutter, but in this case, explosion smoke can actually help you sometimes. It's pretty common in TF2 to peek a doorway that you want to walk through, but not walk entirely through it because it might be sticky trapped. With explosion smoke, it becomes extremely easy to tell when an enemy demo detonates their stickies that might be hiding above a doorway or around a corner, letting you and your team know that it's now much safer to walk forward and take space. Of course, this is a pretty minor trade-off, 
And if you aren't tired of hearing me say it by now, this is, again, up to personal preference. I may as well touch on mouse sensitivity as well. Sensitivity is not a one-size-fits-all setting, and different players prefer vastly different sensitivities. It really is just a matter of finding what works right for how you like to aim and move your mouse. Unlike the related setting, mouse acceleration. What mouse acceleration does is make it so that how far your mouse moves is not the only factor in your aim, but also how quickly you moved it. Due to this extra, kind of random feeling factor, it's no surprise that the vast majority of players prefer to disable mouse acceleration by ticking raw input under mouse settings. Please note, however, that this will not work if you still have mouse acceleration enabled on your operating system, which you will need to independently verify or change based on what system you're using. Finally, crosshairs. As is the trend in this section, as long as your crosshair adequately stands out from the rest of the map and is easy to see, then it completely comes down to preference. Some players will download and install custom crosshairs, or change it every week, or you can just be like me and use a magenta dot for 10 years. Up to you. And with that, just about all the settings that you would want to change in TF2 are taken care of, and you'll be ready to make your TF2 config work with you instead of against you. I'm sure there are some things that I missed, and I didn't dive into too much detail on some topics to not only keep things moving along, but also because they're complicated. TF2 is an old game, and it can be very hard to understand, which is why I'm really thankful for everyone who dedicates time to understanding how the game works and shares it with others. Also, this is the first video in a series I'm planning called Free to Pro, where I intend to package all the information needed to go through the process of a new or casual player learning how competitive TF2 works and how to play it. So it's no surprise that I'm starting with the basic game settings. I think competitive TF2's approachability is a problem that a lot of people face just with the sheer amount of information you have to learn at once, and I want to help ease that. I know that a large chunk of my audience are casual players that don't want to play sixes, so I'm going to challenge myself to frame and explain things in a way that's still entertaining and will still teach people new things, because I absolutely believe that competitive TF2, its nuances, and its concepts can be interesting and engaging for everyone, not just those who play it. One last thing. I've started a second channel where I intend to upload more long-form, unscripted content, mostly from Twitch VODs. That way I can provide more deep dives for anyone interested without cluttering this channel for those that prefer this scripted style. So far I have a video demonstrating and explaining every demo man rollout to mid, as well as map reviews for just about every competitive map if that interests you. But that's all I have to say. Thanks for sticking with me to the end and I hope you learned something new about this game. Have a good one everyone.